Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this session of research highlights from the University of British Columbia's Animal Welfare Program. This program began in 1997 with the generous support from the BCSPCA, the BC Veterinary Medical Association, and many others. Since then, the Animal Welfare Program has worked closely with the BCSPCA, farmers and farming organizations, and many other groups, and that is toward our mission of improving the lives of animals through research, education, and public outreach. So we hope that throughout this session, we can give you just a bit of an introduction into some of the type of work that goes on in our program. And our program is actually very lucky because we were joined last year by Dr. Sasha Protopopova, the inaugural BC SPCA Chair in Companion Animal Welfare, thanks to further funding from the BC SPCA. Her work is helping our program expand into the field of companion animal welfare research by conducting projects involving dogs, cats, rabbits, small mammals, and the people that care for them. She is also presenting later today at this conference, so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about her, you can go check that out. We also do want to take a moment to thank Humane Canada for awarding our group the Leadership in Animal Welfare Innovation Award in 2018 at the Humane Canada Conference. So while we're joining today remotely, we're very, very happy that we're able to be here again this year. So over the course of this talk, we have four of our students from our program who are going to pre present on guardian surrender of companion animals in Canada, humane pest control initiatives, understanding dairy cattle management challenges from the perspective of farmers and veterinarians, and housing and environmental enrichment for laboratory rodents. So to begin, I will introduce myself my name is Bailey Egan and I'm a master's student in this program and my primary focus is understanding the welfare of cats and shelters by studying whether shelter noise, so sounds such as dog barking and cleaning, can cause stress and fear in cats. So this project is under the supervision of Dr. David Fraser at the Animal Welfare Program and it's helped by the immense support of Dr. Amelia Gordon at the BC SPCA. So while working on this project with cats, I have been very lucky to spend a lot of time at various shelters across BC. And this led to the question of why are so many animals ending up in shelters in the first place? So therefore, with the help of the BCSPCA, we decided to analyze this rich data set to address the question of why do British Columbians surrender their dogs and cats? And we tried to look and see if there are any clues or steps that could be taken to reduce the number of animals that are requiring shelters in the first place. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to show you a brief uh, summary of the results from this study. So to do this, first I will summarize the number of animals entering Canadian shelters each year, specifically those of which that are surrendered by their guardians. Then I will briefly highlight what we are seeing in the literature about why this is happening and what we know or what we don't know about why this is occurring specifically in Canada. And finally, I will show you the primary reasons for surrender of dogs and cats to BCSPCA shelters over the decade period from 2008 to 2018. So thanks to Humane Canada for the shelter stats that you're seeing here, we know that approximately 81,000 cats and 30,000 dogs enter Canadian shelters each year. And this is a number that has been mostly decreasing steadily for dogs that you can see there on the graph in orange, as well as for cats, which are represented on the graph in dark green. We know that cats and dogs are coming from a variety of sources, including stray, transfer from another organization, cases of abuse, being born in the shelter, and then of course, guardian surrender. And based on Humane Canada data, approximately 35% of dogs and 34% of cats are brought into Canadian shelters due to guardian surrender. And these estimates that we're seeing in Canada are similar to what we're observing in other areas. So for example, in the United States, estimates show that approximately 30% of the animals that enter shelters are due to guardian surrender, which puts it close to quite, uh, quite close to what we're seeing here from the um, Canadian national statistics. So something that I learned that really struck me about this topic is that according to the downtown dog rescue in South LA, 70% of the people who surrender their pet don't actually want to. It's a result of their circumstances or a lack of resources. A study done by Weiss et al. in 2014 found that many people who surrendered their dogs still in fact love their dogs very, very much and they didn't want to surrender them. And they indicated that if there were options available that could help them keep their dog, they would consider taking those options. So if we were to make a rough estimate for Canada, based on Humane Canada's shelter population estimates, that would be 19,600 cats and 7,140 dogs that are being surrendered by reluctant guardians each year for reasons relating to circumstance or resources. 
So what are these reasons that are causing dogs and cats to be brought into shelters? Well, studies get, uh, conducted in this area demonstrate that dogs and cats are surrendered by their guardians for a variety of reasons due to both the animal itself as well as the guardian. Common categories for reasons that emerge include animal behavior, such as aggression, animal characteristics, such as not being spayed or neutered, or the dog getting too big, training and education. So for example, how much the guardians educated themselves on behavior before adoption, or joining training classes, which we know can affect pet retention. Duration of guardianship, pets are generally more likely to be surrendered if they were in a home for a short period of time compared to a long period of time. Guardian characteristics, such as the size of the family or life events such as moving, and of course this list does go on. Reasons for, reasons for animal surrender are often quite complicated and they likely include a combination of more than one of these drivers that are mentioned here. Studies related to surrender incorporate data collected across subjects, sample sizes, and demographics. Therefore, location-specific studies are needed to understand what local factors are at play. And these factors are mostly unknown in Canada and mostly unknown in BC. So we decided to look into what is causing guardian surrender of dogs and cats in BC. We pulled all surrender data from 2008 to 2018 across 36 different BC SPCA shelter facilities. When guardians surrender an animal, they provide the SPCA with a primary reason. So we chose to categorize these reasons into logical groups based on literature on the subject. So before digging into these reasons, though, I do want to briefly highlight a couple important trends in the data. So thankfully for both dogs and cats, intake has decreased quite a bit over the past decade. So for dogs, this has continually decreased. And for cats that you're looking at there in the dark blue, we see a bit of a plateau in the last couple of years with about 7,700 cats. And um, although we did see a, a slight drop by a couple hundred in 2018. But when we look at what percentage of those intakes are guardian surrender, the numbers, numbers are actually very similar to what we see nationally and in other countries. So remember that was about 30 to 35%. And this has remained somewhat consistent over the past decade, although it does seem to be increasing slightly there when you look at the, the cats in the dark blue. So when we looked at the data that we pulled from the database um, from the SPCA, the population between dogs and cats was quite similar. There were similar distributions of sex. It was mostly even 50-50, uh, except um, for cats, females were surrendered slightly more than males. Age groups were similar for dogs and cats. Young animals are surrendered more often than older animals. Similar health statuses were seen based on the Asilomar Accord. So this is a standardized classification of health status of animals that are entering shelters and we saw similar spay and neuter statuses. We also saw some notable similarities in reasons for surrender. So when we grouped these reasons, we decided to do so in two categories, relating to the guardian or relating to the animal. So when we look at these animal related reasons, you will see here we have four categories, animal characteristics, animal health, community cat or dog, or behavior. And these reasons can be broken down further into subcategories, which I'm showing here in pink. So for example, within the behavior category, behavior can be further classified as aggressive, house soiling, and so on. These categories can even be further divided beyond this, but because of our relatively short amount of time today, I'm going to stick to the levels that I'm showing here. So I imagine you immediately noticed something about this. Um, these categories are not mutually exclusive. So for example, when you look at house soiling, it's often linked to anxiety and stress, but these are listed as separate issues here. And the reason for that is that we are using archival data from the BC SPCA. So we are reporting on reasons for surrender from the guardian's perspective. So while we may know that the cat is peeing in the house because it's anxious or something has happened in the home, the guardian has brought that animal through the door for the presenting reason of house soiling. So that is what we're reporting on here, those primary reasons reported by owners. And here are the guardian related reasons. So within which we have six categories, can't afford, housing issues, abandoned, guardian health, unwanted, and personal issues. And most of these can also be classified further as we uh, just saw with the animal reasons. So as you can see here, when looking at the type of surrender, guardian or animal, we saw these trends were very incredibly similar between dogs and cats, with guardian surrender making up the majority of the surrenders that we observed. So within guardian surrender, there was one reason that stood out amongst all the others as the primary reason for surrender of dogs and cats. And I imagine it, if you're um, thinking about it right now, you can guess what that is. It was housing issues. 
So housing issues uh, for this included any animal that was brought in for reasons related to housing, moving, or an inability to find a suitable home environment for the animal. So this made up for 27% of cat surrenders and 24% of dog surrenders. And this finding is not unique to BC. It's actually quite remarkable how commonly in the literature housing is listed as the primary reason for surrender, regardless of the country or region. So even in BC, where BC SPCAs are located across a whole province, housing remains a primary reason for surrender across shelters, and it isn't specific to densely populated areas, um, like in Vancouver, for example. So from this, it seems that if, if there were one area that could be changed to help keep pets in homes, it would be improving pet-friendly housing. Of course, no easy task. But we see some other primary reasons as well. Here I am going to highlight the top five reasons for surrender of dogs. For dogs after housing issues, we see personal issues, being unwanted, animal behavior, and can't afford. So when digging a little deeper into the personal issues category, we see animal care issues making up the majority of this group. So animal care issues would include things like, I have no time, they're too much responsibility, I can't focus on the pet's needs. And from this information, it seems that guardians are having issues meeting the needs of the dogs. And this is interesting as it's not really a reason that we see coming up near as much for cats. Number three of the dog surrender reasons is being unwanted. So when we dig a little bit deeper into this, we see that most of this is due to people having too many animals and they need to surrender one. So what struck me when I saw this was the result, the, how few of these were a result of an animal being given as a gift. So while we do also often see policies in place against adopting an animal as a gift for somebody else, this small number of animals surrendered because they were an unwanted gift likely supports the growing body of literature that demonstrates that pets received as gifts are at least as likely or sometimes even more likely to remain in their homes than pets that were acquired in other ways. For number four reasons for surrender of dogs is animal behavior. So as you can see from this chart, there are two categories that are making up uh, the majority of these behavior surrenders, and that is objectionable activities and aggression. So when we look a little more at these objectionable activities, it does seem clear that issues like escaping, activity level, and noise, which when we're dealing with dogs is primarily barking, makes up most of this category. When looking at the other reason causing most of those dog behavior surrenders, we see that aggression accounts for 26% of behavioral related surrenders. So when we're talking about aggression, we're not referring to only scenarios where, for example, a dog is attacking a person. We define aggression for both dogs and cats as threats or harmful actions directed toward another person or animal, and that could be growling, hissing, or biting. Within aggression in dogs, many of these cases were unspecified, which means that the primary reason that was provided was listed as something uh, nonspecific, such as biting, but we were not given any more context about what happened in that biting case. So of the categories where context is given, we see aggression to animals makes up 34% of the aggression surrenders, while aggression for people is 11%. And finally, number five, for the common reasons for surrender of dogs, it, it's financial issues or can't afford. And as we see here, when the context is provided, most of the reasons dogs are being surrendered for is financial reasons, is um, due to an inability to afford veterinary treatment. So unfortunately from this, we often don't know the specifics of what that procedure was that they couldn't afford, but we do see this as a commonly uh, occurring reason. And now moving on to the re top reasons for cats. As you can see, we do see some similar categories to dogs like housing, being unwanted, can't afford, and animal behavior. But then of course we do see differences as well. The primary for surrender reason is again housing, but their second most common reason for surrender is guardian health. And again, I can imagine that you can guess what is making up most of this category. It is allergies. The number three reason for cat surrender is being unwanted. Again, as we saw with dogs, most of this is due to having too many animals and a very small amount are specifically indicated as being unwanted gifts, even smaller amount than with dogs. The fourth reason for guardian surrender of cats is financial reasons. And again, like dogs, in cases where we have information specified about what the guardian cannot afford, most of those are medical cases. The fifth most common reason for guardian surrender of cats is being abandoned. 
So these are cases where a person abandoned an own cat to a shelter on behalf of somebody else. So because the guardian has left that animal behind. And as you can see, we see this happening a lot with friends or relatives or with tenants. And this is not a common reason for dogs, nowhere near as common as we see it happening with cats, which makes me wonder what is it about cats that makes them perhaps easier or more likely to abandon than dogs as we do see this so much more often. And finally, for cats, I have included the sixth reason here because the top five reasons were all related to the guardian. Uh, the sixth most common reason, as you can see, is behavior. And like dogs, we have two main reasons for surrender within that behavior category. Although the behaviors themselves are, of course, different, with house soiling and animal conflict making up the majority of cases for cats. So to briefly summarize here, Guardian-related reasons make up the majority of the animal surrenders that we see and that we have seen for the last decade to the BCSPCA. Housing issues are the most commonly seen reason across the board. Medical costs do seem to be a common reason that cats and dogs are ending up in shelters. From this data, at least, it seems to support the idea that gifts do not often result in surrender of dogs and cats. Dogs seem to be uniquely surrendered because they are too much responsibility, while cats seem to be uniquely surrendered due to triggering allergies and being abandoned. And both dogs and cats have commonly seen but unique from one another behavior issues causing them to be surrendered. As guardian surrender remains a primary reason for intake into shelters, perhaps this information can offer us ideas about how to be proactive and look for opportunities to prevent animals from entering shelters in the first place. So in BC, as we see, and in Canada and around the world, a large proportion of intake into shelters is due to guardian surrender. In some cases, we may be able to use the information gained from guardian surrender data to identify opportunities to be proactive and prevent surrender in the first place where it's appropriate. So for example, as housing is the most common reason for surrender, despite the fact that studies have shown pet-friendly apartments provide more revenue for landlords, longer tenancies, and there's a little difference in damages, damages compared to pet-prohibited apartments. Well, in some cases, there, the issues could be too significant to intervene and it might not be appropriate. In others, preventing surrender may be as simple as providing a pet deposit for guardians. As over the last decade, we've seen over 11,000 animals surrendered to BCSPCAs due to housing issues, successful housing interventions have the potential to help many animals. Or when looking at co the commonly seen issue of medical costs, it may be a question of determining if the medical procedure itself is even less expensive than the procedure of bringing the animal into the shelter, caring for it, feeding it, putting it up for adoption, and rehoming it into another loving home. In an intervention program run in South LA, the majority of interventions that a shelter did that ended up keeping animals in homes was providing a free or decreased cost spay or neuter. As financial issues were the reason for surrender of almost 5,000 animals. This is another area that could be targeted for further intervention. Or when looking at behavior, with dogs we see escaping and activity level as common reasons for surrender. What if helping with a fence repair or recruiting the help of, of a dog walker or a trainer could help keep that dog in a loving home? Or with cats, we see house soiling and animal conflict as a primary issue. And as the mature, majority of cat house soiling problems can be resolved with the right information if caught quickly, what if these surrenders could be decreased by ensuring that guardians have easy access to that information and continued support? So considering around the world, we are seeing guardian surrender remains a significant source of intake of dogs and cats to shelters. Identifying, understanding, and helping to prevent these surrenders has the potential to offer a large amount of animals remaining in their loving homes and out of the shelter in the first place. And with that, I want to thank the BCSPCA not only for the use of their data here, but for their continued sharing of their knowledge with me. I specifically have to want to thank Dr. Amelia Gordon and Michelle Hadikin, who have prov provided me with extensive support on this project and many others at the SPCA, all of whom I would really love to list here. But as I actually have so many people to thank, I would need a much longer talk if I were going to do that. And I want to thank Zoetis Canada and My Tax Accelerate Fellowship for funding my research. And then thank you, of course, to you for listening virtually. I hope you'll reach out if you have any questions or if you want to talk about any of the information here or any of the studies I discussed. I would um, obviously was only able to show some trends here. So if there's other trends you'd like to learn more about, please reach out. Um, I'm happy to discuss more. There's my contact information. And with that, I'm going to pass this off on to uh, my colleague in the program, Erin Ryan. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Ryan. I'm a master's student in the UBC Animal Welfare Program. 
and I'll be here talking today about my intended research project in humane rodent control. So for a little bit of background, my interest in this topic started as sort of a collaboration between UBC and the BCSPCA. So five years ago, when I started at the BCSPCA, uh, we worked together with UBC to investigate humane wildlife control. And this was of great interest to the SPCA because we had uh, so many cases through our wildlife rehabilitation centers that were uh, as a result of pest control gone wrong or improper use. And we wanted to see what challenges there were going on in the world. So together in this partnership with UBC, we brought together international experts in wildlife control and pest control, including academics, actual industry practitioners, government officials, and really sat down to convene uh, some solutions. And the results of that collaboration were one, this publication in 2017, uh, on international consensus principles for ethical wildlife control. So this is where from that large group of worldwide industry experts, we were actually able to sit down and agree on what ethical wildlife control looks like. And with my work at the BCSPCA, and as a result of kind of these standards, we then developed Animal Kind, which is an animal welfare accreditation program, which started as for pest, pest control companies, so wildlife and rodent control, but has also moved on to accredit other unregulated businesses like dog training. And while developing Animal Kind, we really had a couple questions. So we consulted with a lot of industry groups because we wanted to make these standards the best available. And as of yet, they're the only animal welfare accreditation for wildlife control. Um, but we wanted to make them realistic. So it was really important to us that we have industry buy-in. So in developing these standards, we did consult with industry groups like the Structural Pest Management Association. And one of the things that we kept getting stuck on was whose wildlife, who gets considered in our standards, because it made sense to all of these companies to include raccoons, for example, um, and squirrels and all these other wild animals that we would typically consider. But one of the things we kept getting stuck on was mice and rats and what to do with them because a lot of these companies could agree, of course, we could do exclusion and non-lethal methods for raccoons and it would be very, very easy, but we kept getting stuck on rats and they kept saying, well, let's just make it about wildlife and not rats. So it was really our decision to say, you know, we care about mice and rats and we care about how humanely they're treated. And so we wanted to make sure that we were doing the best job possible. So when I'm talking about rodents, these are the three species that I'm primarily looking at. These are known as the commensal rodents. So commensal meaning to share one's table. And of course, these species have all lived in close association with humans, and they really rely on us for their food source. And again, what makes pest control so important is who is a customer of pest control. And surprise, it's all of us. If you've ever walked into a building, you're a customer of pest control. Uh, if you have a shelter, I'm sure you have to use pest control for help with dog food, cat food that certainly attracts mice and rats. Uh, if you've ever walked into a school, a hospital, any type of restaurant, they use pest control. And I used to think that this was, um, you know, a sign maybe that somewhere was dirty, that they had pest control. But actually, my work now has shifted my perspective to see that everyone needs a preventative pest control program, and that's actually the responsible thing to do. So looking at pest control in Canada, this alone is a $2 billion industry. It's one of the few businesses that really thrives during times of recession, because of course, as we hit hard times, rodents are usually on the upswing. And in Canada, this employs over a thousand companies with over 13,000 employees across the country. And most of that work uh, relates to insects. So think about bed bugs, ants, silverfish, um, but about 13% of that work is rodents. And that's a really significant portion. Uh, wildlife control is actually a much, much smaller part of that. Um, but it just really emphasized for me how important it is that we included rodents when we were looking at humaneness. 
and some of the reasons why pest control is important, especially for rodents. Uh, the number one being health and safety. Everybody knows that rodents can transmit diseases to people and to animals. And of course, in this time of pandemic right now, it's a good reminder that rodents are actually the primary agents of most human pandemics in history. So health and safety is a really big concern. And of course, this is our primary concern when we're looking at rodent control in facilities like schools and hospitals and food facilities. And we just can't overstress how important that is. Property protection is also another uh, big issue because when rodents gnaw, they can cause infrastructure damage, but it's especially important if they're doing things like gnawing on home wiring, because this can of course lead to fires, which endangers not only property, but people's lives. It's also important from a conservation perspective. Uh, as humans spread, so do rats. They tend to follow us where we take them um, with things like shipping and other trade of goods. So if you think about islands, uh, places where rats have been introduced to islands where they were previously no predators, they can do a lot of damage on the ecosystem and animals that live there. So for example, rats are responsible for a lot of declines in seabirds that may nest on the ground or nest in cliff tops where they're not used to predators being able to access them. And so looking at pest control, I just wanted to go for an overview of kind of the current tools that are used and common in the industry today. This was the big surprise for me. Once you know what these are, you'll start seeing them everywhere. You'll see them outside of every building, along the perimeter of every restaurant. You'll start seeing them in hidden corners in your apartment or in stairwells. Uh, and these are called bait boxes. So they can host any number of tools and you won't know what's inside of them without opening them up. So inside these bait boxes, it could be poison bait, it could be food, it could be glue traps, it could be snap traps, um, it could be nothing. Uh, in some cases, because these boxes are so cheap to manufacture, if a building suspends their pest control contract or they change who's carrying their contract, rather than coming back and picking up these boxes, a lot of pest control companies will just leave them behind because that's a much easier option. So what I found is that a lot of times these are full of cobwebs and dust and poison long expired and it's, it's very challenging. This is what rodenticide actually looks like. And I'm sure a lot of us here today have experience with this and not in a good way. Uh, when rodents ingest rodenticides, it can take them many days or even weeks to die. And they die from essentially bleeding out. Um, it's not a humane death, we would argue at all, but this is one of the most common tools still used in the pest control industry. It also has really significant impacts on other wildlife. So any animals that primarily eat rodents, if they eat poison carcasses, the toxicity will build up in their tissues and also cause them to experience poisoning. So for example, owls or eagles or other raptors, uh, their diet is primarily made up of rodents. And especially in the city where there's a lot of pest control programs in place, this can build up very quickly. It's also been seen in coyotes, especially in urban areas where they're preying on rats. Um, and has also been seen in animals like cougars. This is a glue trap and it's exactly what it sounds like. This is a little tray full of glue and the intention is that when they're placed in areas of high rodent activity or along sort of their runways that they use, the rodents become trapped in the glue. The biggest problem with these is what happens next because when they were invented, it was intended as a catch trap, not as a kill trap. But most of the time these are placed out and rodents will become trapped in the glue and they could get their face stuck in the glue and suffocate. They may become so stressed that they'll try to chew their own limbs off and they could take a long time to die from just dehydration, exposure, and it's a really, really horrible way to go. On top of the inhumaneness towards rodents, this is also really dangerous for non-target animals. So birds have often gotten stuck in these. We've seen snakes, squirrels, kids. It's not a great system. Uh, a few years ago in, I think 2016, there was actually a kitten that got stuck in one in Vernon and required a specialty veterinary care to get out. 
thankfully she was adopted and is now living a happy, healthy life in her new home. These are snap traps, or if you're from the UK, they're called breakback traps. And they come in a number of different styles, so it's not always easy to recognize what they look like. The main problem with snap traps is that they vary so widely in performance. So a snap trap that's well set up, has really, really good spring power, can actually be a relatively humane death and very quick. But you never know what you're gonna buy. And all, these are all available at hardware stores. So people, by placing them improperly or by purchasing one unknowingly with pretty low spring power, animals can easily get caught by their limbs or tails, or it might not have enough spring power to result in breaking the back. So it could just be that they suffocate slowly. So it's really hard to know which traps are gonna be good and which ones are gonna be bad. And there's no labeling in Canada, there's no testing, there's no way to guarantee what kind of trap you're gonna end up with. These are called multi-catch traps. And unfortunately, they're often marketed as humane traps because they're a live trap. But I believe that's quite a misnomer because these aren't designed to be opened. These are designed so that mice and rats can go inside, but they can't come back out. In many cases, these boxes aren't even able to be opened. So what happens is that animals keep entering and they don't get out. So either they'll die from dehydration or exposure, they'll become extremely stressed, they'll cannibalize, or sometimes people will just come and take this entire box and submerge it in water. And this is a horrible, horrible way to go. Live traps are available for rodents, but they do come with challenges. So on the right is sort of a cage trap that you could use for rats. There's not exactly a cage trap small enough for mice, but the example on the left is a type of live trap for mice. It's called a tip trap. So both of these are designed to be, to catch animals alive and to later release them. These run into challenges though, of course, uh, because it matters how they're set and it matters how often they're being checked. So if an animal gets stuck and nobody checks on that trap for three days, that's not any more humane than any of those other options. You also run into challenges with exposure. So for example, if that cage trap or that tip trap is set up in direct sunlight, especially with the tip trap where it's very small and the mouse is very small, animals can easily overheat or succumb to heat exhaustion. Another challenge is these aren't particularly effective on a large scale. So this might be an option that, you know, I would definitely choose to use in my own home when dealing with a few mice and rats. But if we're talking about a hospital, a lot of these places are legally required to do lethal control and there's no way that they could be uh, allowed to live trap and release animals. There's also some exciting research happening in areas of fertility control. So essentially birth control for mice and rats. And this would slowly reduce the population over time, um, but it's not yet commercially available. It's still being tested and approved in the US by the US by the US FDA, um, but we're still many, many years off from this being widely available. So here I am, I'm stuck with this problem where mice and rat infestations are increasing, the rodents aren't going anywhere, people continue to spread, rodent populations continue to spread. Uh, there are situations where lethal control is sometimes legally required. So even though in my own home, I would do something very different, there are situations where facilities are being legally required to do rodent control. And I'm dealing with calls all the time. People who love animals, they want to help, they wanna do what's best, they wanna make the right choice. And even at the institutional level and municipal level, people want to do the right thing, but there's just not options and they don't know how. So the result is that they're stuck between these least worst options or you know, the humane but slightly ineffective options like life trapping. And so this led into my master's research. So what I really wanted to do was help companies find, help companies and individuals find a tool that could be more humane. So this is the trap that I'm looking at. Uh, it's called the Good Nature A24 Rat and Stoat Automatic Humane Trap. Uh, we don't have stoats in Canada, of course. This trap was developed in New Zealand. 
uh, and has been used quite successfully for a number of pest control programs, primarily in sort of rural conservation areas. And I'm really interested in seeing what its capacity is in sort of the semi-urban or urban areas as a form of mouse and rat control. So this is kind of what the trap looks like exploded. So this is a, a lethal trap. It's a captive bolt trap. And what that means is that in that tunnel here, there is a bolt. So when animals are attracted by the lure in the top of the trap, they investigate with their nose. Their nose pushes the trigger needle, which means their head is in the right place. And it's power, uh, the tiny gas canister powers a bolt that crushes the skull. All of their field data, which has been published in New Zealand, has shown really, really amazing kill times. But this has never been field tested in Canada and it's never been peer reviewed. So this is definitely uh, an aspect that I wanted to look into. And this just kind of shows you how it works. So the rats and mice are attracted by the bait, they investigate the trap fires, and then they actually just drop out the bottom. So the trap is self resetting, it's ready to go again, and predators can come by and scavenge the bodies which are now poison free. And this is what it looks like set up against a tree. So it's meant to be mounted against a tree or a fence post. There are portable stands that are available. And I'll be setting up sites just like this um, around UBC's in-vessel composting facility where they definitely have challenges with rodents. So for phase one of my study, what I really wanted to make sure was that there aren't any risks to other animals. So in this phase of the study, which is what I'm starting now, uh, the traps will be baited and set, um, but they won't be activated. So I want to video all activity. I want to see whether or not birds visit, how they interact with it. I wanna see skunks, raccoons, squirrels. I wanna see if they're able to get their hands inside, their heads inside, um, but in a way that's safe. In phase two, once I'm absolutely certain that other animals aren't able to get in there, I'll actually activate the traps. And so I'll be monitoring this with video cameras, motion activated video cameras, so I can actually measure uh, and evaluate the humaneness or time to death. And in this instance, I will of course be using special blockers to make sure that other animals can't get inside. What I'm hoping to see is that it creates, you know, it's a tool that makes carcasses safe for other animals. Um, it's not a risk to other animals like dogs, raccoons, skunks, squirrels. Ideally, it's going to be a humane kill, so it'll be relatively quick. Uh, this trap is also self-resetting, which is great for sensitive conservation areas because you don't need to visit as often. So if you have particularly sensitive vegetation, you don't have to step on it or, uh, you know, access it and possibly disturb some of the animals that live there. And because there's no poison used, it means that any animals that are killed by these traps are safe for scavengers like owls and coyotes. So thank you for coming to join me. I look forward to presenting some of the results of this research, perhaps at the next conference. And just so you're reassured, this is not a wild rat. This is me with a shelter rat who looks like a wild rat. Her name is Luna and she has since been adopted into a loving home. So thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today to hear about some of the highlights from the Animal Welfare Program. Uh, my name is Katie Mills and I am a PhD candidate uh, and I work with farmers and veterinarians uh, using social science methods to understand how we as researchers can help improve management decisions and therefore animal welfare for dairy farmers. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to be presenting for you today is entitled The Role of Advisors When Developing Standard Operating Procedures for Dairy Calf Welfare. And I want to kind of flip things around a little because I think that it's important um, to provide some context for the research that we do. And so I'd like to give my acknowledgements up front. Uh, to start with, I would love to acknowledge my supervisor, uh, Marina von Kaiserlink. Uh, as well as Dan Weary and Katie Korleski, my co-authors on this work. And I'm going to introduce Katie in a little more detail in a minute as well. 
I'd also like to thank all of our amazing funding sources that made this research possible. Uh, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, as well as the Canadian Dairy Commission for funding uh, me personally, as well as the Investment Agriculture Foundation and the Dairy Industry Research and Education Committee for funding the project that I'm going to be presenting. To my animal welfare program colleagues, some of whom you are hearing from today, uh, as well as all the other people that make up uh, the wonderfully diverse group of, of colleagues. And last but certainly not least, our participant farmers and veterinarians, uh, without whom this research would not be possible. And we are extremely grateful uh, that they, for their continued support through research like this. So the Animal Welfare Program has a long history of uh, focusing on farmed animal welfare. And part of that is due to the immense number of farm animals that are raised in Canada, but also around the world. Uh, if we focus specifically on the dairy industry, approximately 1 million dairy cows are currently being milked in the Canadian dairy system, with 10% of those, or about 100,000, uh, animals here, right here in BC. We are very lucky that a large portion of dairy farms are located in the Fraser Valley region, which is where we conduct most of our research. Uh, and that is partly due to this facility that you see on the screen here. Uh, this is the UBC Dairy Education and Research Center. Uh, it's a working dairy farm that has approximately 260 dairy cows that contribute to the dairy system, so feeding Canadians. Um, but also, it's a facility where we're able to conduct animal welfare research as well as reproduction research. And is home to undergraduate students and graduate students and visiting researchers who make this all of these research projects run. Today though, I'm gonna focus on these little girls here. Uh, so today I'm gonna be focusing on dairy calves. Um, because we work so closely with farmers uh, in the Fraser Valley as well as other regions, we've been able to understand how management practices work on different farms. Um, and we know that there is a huge variation when we're talking about how individual farms are running um, and managing their, their baby calves. And we know that this is a really critical period for dairy cows. Um, there are a lot of practices that need to take place in order for the individuals to be set up for success in the future. And so the one especially important practice is uh, colostrum management. So that first really highly nutritious uh, milk that is gonna set up that calf for success. Two of our colleagues, uh, Dax Atkinson and Christine Sumner, conducted a study with approximately 40 farms uh, to understand this critical period. So to understand the colostrum management period. And they found that there was lots of variation, but also some farmers weren't uh, using best practices and they weren't able to set those calves up for success. And so that got us thinking of how can we work to improve this, this procedure by working with the farmers themselves. And one way to improve best practices or to implement best practices on farms is to, to work on standard operating procedures or SOPs. And this is not gonna be super surprising for people in the shelter world because standard operating procedures are very much a part of the culture. Um, but on dairy farms, they're not. Uh, I would like to give just a little bit of an overview of SOPs here, uh, maybe for those who aren't super familiar with them. Uh, but SOPs or standard operating procedures are step-by-step -step instructions for how to perform a task. And the goal of these is really to reduce uh, variability among different employees. It kind of creates that uniformity that you want, especially when you're talking about medical procedures or animal care procedures. We do know that on dairy farms, SOPs are required for many on-farm animal welfare assurance programs. Uh, in Canada, that would be Dairy Farmers of Canada's ProAction Initiative, which is a requirement of all 
dairy farmers in Canada, but there's also other programs as well. The interesting thing about it though, as I mentioned, SOPs are not super common on dairy farms traditionally, so we don't have a lot of information about how they're developed, how they're used, or even if they're used. And these were kind of all of the questions that we had um, going into designing this study. What do SOPs look like and how do they function in the context of dairy farms? And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, one of my co-authors, Katie Korleski, who is pictured here with me and some of the awesome calves at the UBC Dairy Center. We had these ideas, these big questions about how SOPs functioned um, in the context of dairy farms and how we as, as researchers can really help farmers to implement best practices in these SOPs. And so we conducted this study from April to December of 2018. Uh, and one other part that I wanna touch on and add in is how advisors fit into this whole um, this whole system. So we have these SOPs, we as researchers want to come in and help farmers to improve them, but advisors are super important in that. And we as researchers, while these participants were so wonderful in welcoming us onto their farms, we are not a trusted advisor to them. But there are other trusted advisors out there for dairy farmers, and those are the people we really wanted to work with. So when we're talking about advisors, uh, Advisors can be super important when looking to improve animal care practices, particularly because they have that trusted relationship with the farmer. And so in the dairy industry, there is quite a bit of research that shows that veterinarians are viewed as a very trusted advisor to dairy farmers. And we know this uh, across contexts, so like in lots of different countries, um, as well as even in the Fraser Valley region where we work. And there are lots of factors that influence that trusted advisor relationship. So it could be the perceived knowledge or education level of the advisor, but also those other personal relationship aspects. So are they trustworthy? Um, do you have a good relationship with them? All important factors that influence that, that advisee-advisor relationship. And so we had all of these big questions going into the study. We wanted to know how they function, how our SOPs developed, um, how can we improve colostrum management on these farms. And while I would love to present all of this to you, um, unfortunately, due to time, I, I picked one of the questions that I think will be the most um, potentially beneficial, which is looking at what factors affect advice adherence. So what are the things that, um, that when farmers are told this advice by their advisors, do they follow it or not and, and why? And I think the best way in order to uh, set this up is to give you an overview of the entire study. Um, so to start, I, I've drawn out kind of a schematic here. If farmers were interested in participating in the study, uh, they gave us a call. They maybe had an existing colostrum management SOP or newborn calf care SOP, but they wanted to modify it or they wanted to develop a complete new one. And so when they did that, um, we scheduled a meeting, sat down with them and collected some demographic information as well as took a photo of their current SOP. And then at the end of that meeting, what we did was ask them, okay, who do you really want to have at the table when we're making this new SOP? Um, would you like to have your advisors there? So external advisors, such as veterinarians um, or other advisors as well, or would you want to only have uh, farm staff? So are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to in include some other employees? For a time's sake, I am just going to present uh, the research or the the farms that had the external advisors there. So this was veterinarians, even though we said they could invite whoever they wanted. Um, ultimately, it was only veterinarians that were invited to participate. And again, I think this speaks to the idea of the trusted relationship that a farmer has with their veterinarian. 
So at the second meeting, we sat down, we developed this new SOP or modified an existing one. Uh, we as researchers brought lots of different examples that farmers could use. Um, and at the end of the meeting, farmers finalized this and sent the finalized SOP to us. And then three months later, we followed up to see how it was working, if it was working or anything that they had changed. So at the end of the study, as I mentioned, it was an eight month study. Uh, we had so much data. We had uh, hours and hours and hours of audio files um, and the finalized SOPs. And from all of that, five main themes emerged when it comes to looking at advice adherence. So the first is the feasibility of the advice, the additional resources that were required of farmers, the priority that the advice took for the farmer, other advisors that were involved in this process, and the importance of data. And I'm going to go into each of these a little more so you can get an idea of, of what some of those factors look like. So the first, feasibility of the advice. Uh, in a lot of cases, the advice that was offered by advisors, uh, farmers really liked the idea of using this advice, but then when they tried it out, they found it didn't actually work with their farm management um, or their individual barn design. So for example, I love, I love this quote from a, a participant farmer. Uh, we had little cards that was working good. So they had these tiny little cap cards that they placed on the, um, beside each of the hutches or the calf pens so that they could track all of that information for each of the calves. But the calves eat them. <laughs> so we had to stop using them because the, cap, the cards are bigger than the stand. And so the babies, they see them and they lick them and we've lost a bunch. And so this idea that even though they really liked the advice offered, it just didn't end up working for them. The second theme that emerged was the resources that were required of farmers. So one that I think can be applied in lots of different contexts, not just in the results of this study, but was the use of technology. So farmers were required to use um, some kind of software in order to make the changes to their SOP. But in some cases, they didn't have it um, downloaded on their computer, so Microsoft Word even, or they weren't able to use that technology. And I think this is something that we as researchers hadn't really considered and is an important fact when, or important consideration when moving forward. We also were asking farmers to invest extra time in this, and it might not have been time that they, they had to invest. And also the financial limitations. So in some cases, the uh, advice offered required that farmers uh, purchase something in order to adhere to that advice. So if we're talking about colostrum management, that could mean that they had to purchase um, a, a piece of equipment that could manage or that could um, monitor colostrum quality. So that was an added expense for them. Also the priority the advice took. So farmers that enrolled in the study were very interested in updating their SOP or creating a new one, but I think the priority that that took in the lives of the farmers was very different across the participants. So for example, if there was illness or sickness, some farmers were super excited to, to make these changes. Whereas in this case here, the farmer's saying that nothing was broken, right? It's not like, oh, we're screwing up here all the time. We seem to have most of our bases covered. So the idea that the, the priority is super important and that is gonna affect um, the adherence to advice. There was also the other advisors that either were or weren't involved in this process. So for example, the veterinarians were part of that development meeting. They sat down with the farmers and we all worked on it together. But the follow-up was equally as important. In this case here, uh, a farmer really wanted to draw blood to test for passive transfer success. And basically what that means is they wanted to see if their colostrum management program was working. But when asked if the vet was involved to help with that, uh, this farmer said, not really, no. And then they laughed uncomfortably. 
he's a smart guy, he knows his stuff, but he's just so busy with everything else. So I think for advisors, the takeaway here is really following up and making sure that, that if advice is offered and the farmers accept it, that we, we follow up and we make sure that if we are needed in some way, that we follow through with that. And the final theme was the importance of data. So during a lot of uh, these new SOPs that were created, uh, farmers implemented data collection of some kind. So that could be that they're testing the quality of the colostrum, that could be that they're, they're testing that, that passive transfer success rate. All of this data was really important to, for farmers to understand their management in a new way. And I think this is perfectly exemplified here because in this example, the farmer was testing that passive transfer success rate and they went from 40% to 90% in one month. And so that is a huge difference when we're talking about setting these calves up for success. And what they found is that their employee might not have been following the protocol as they laid it out. So we assumed the protocol was happening, it was in place, but we think it probably wasn't. So I'm using data collection as a way of making management changes. So, uh, just a few take home messages uh, that I would like to leave you guys with today. This project adds to a long history in the animal welfare program of working with stakeholders to improve animal welfare practices. Uh, and we're very happy that we have amazing relationships with uh, people in the dairy industry as well as other animal industries. A one size fits all approach to advice isn't gonna work. I think one of the biggest things we found from this study is that tailoring advice to the individual farm or the individual farmer is super important and will be most successful when we're talking about improving animal welfare practices. Also, the relationships between farmers and their trusted advisors are super important. Uh, farmers will make management decisions if they, or management changes, sorry, if they trust the source of the information. And so that relationship really can't be taken for granted. And finally, as someone who uses social science methods, uh, qualitative studies such as this can allow us to understand animal welfare challenges in a very different way uh, and a deeper way while building relationships with people in the industry. And truly, when I say we couldn't conduct uh, this research without the farmers in, and veterinarians in the Fraser Valley, I mean it. And I'm so grateful for all of their participation um, and their willingness to, to improve their practices, which ultimately is the goal here. And so with that, I would like to say thank you so much for having us today, um, even though it's virtual. And if you have any questions at all, um, my contact information is there on the screen and I would be happy to discuss this or any of the other um, data and results that came out of this study. Thank you so much. Okay, um, hello, my name is Anna Ratuski. I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia in the Animal Welfare Program. And I'm gonna be talking about some of our projects focused on improving housing for laboratory rodents. And just to start off, I would like to highlight um, some of the trends in animal use for teaching and testing in science. Um, so the number of animals used worldwide is actually increasing. And uh, depending on where you look, there's an estimated uh, 115 to 190 million animals used globally every year. Um, and this has been increasing over the years, despite the fact that uh, there are many efforts to reduce the number of animals used or replace animal use altogether. If we look at the use of mice and rats in Canada, over the last uh, eight or nine years, we see the number of rats has remained quite stable. Um, around 230,000 rats are used per year in Canada, and around 1.5 million mice are used per year, and this has been increasing over the years. So while ideally we wouldn't be using these animals uh, for research at all, um, you can see that that's not decreasing, it's actually in some cases increasing. And so a lot of our research is focused on how to make the lives of these animals better 
um, when they're housed in these facilities. Um, just as an overview of what rodent housing looks like, we can see on the left an example of a standard mouse cage and on the right uh, an example of a standard rat cage. So the one on the left would typically be referred to as a shoebox cage. It's roughly the size of a shoebox and this cage would house two to five mice. It would typically contain bedding, uh, paper nesting material, and some form of shelter, which is typically a plastic hut or a plastic tunnel. On the right, we see a rat cage where um, the, they are also given bedding and nesting material of some sort, also usually paper, um, and typically a PVC pipe is their shelter. And you would see maybe two to three rats in a cage of this size. And I just want to highlight that there are quite a few documented um, negative impacts on animal welfare from these housing systems. Um, however, they are still quite prevalent and it's likely that they aren't going anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately. So I'm going to focus on two of our recent projects that are focused on trying to make housing better for laboratory rodents. The first project I'll talk about is about getaway lofts for laboratory rats that are housed with their pups. And the second project I'll talk about is focused on providing playpen access to standard house mice. We know from other species that there are welfare benefits of getaway housing. And what I mean by getaway housing is uh, an environment that allows uh, a mom to get away from her offspring. So in pigs, we see that when given the opportunity, sows will choose to spend more time away from their piglets later on in lactation. And then they'll also show decreased weight loss because of this. Uh, minks will show reduced stereotypic behaviors and improved teat conditions when they're allowed to access a getaway loft. And laboratory mice housed in cages with getaway tunnels show decreased pup mortality. In a naturalistic condition for a rat, you would see more of this um, complex burrow system. So this is more of an artistic representation of it, but you can see on the, the bottom left, you have a litter of pups that are a little bit older. And on the bottom right, we have a rat that's nursing a litter, but she also here has the opportunity to spend time away from the burrow. And that's been documented as well as um, she'll spend more time away as pups are growing older in a more naturalistic environment. But what about rats that are bred for research? So we've seen what a typical standard cage looks like. Um, and this is how a rat bred for research would also typically be housed. So there's limited ability to control the amount of contact with pups, um, which leads us to predict that increasing dam agency or increasing her ability to control her interactions with her offspring may improve welfare. I'm going to show a video of um, a rat that's housed in the cage that we use for this research and just demonstrates a rat that's not trying to engage with her pups. So these pups are around two weeks old and they're kind of pestering their mom and anyone who is stuck in quarantine with small children right now might be able to relate to this. Um, she's not trying to provide any maternal care right now. And she's actually able to go up into that loft to kind of get away from them and spend some time not nursing. Um, and I will point out that this is not a really typical cage. This is a specific uh, brand and model that we have available in some of our facilities. And so I wanted to look at this more closely and see if this loft has welfare benefits. So the overall research question here is simply, do rat moms need a break from their pups? Our predictions here are that rats will make use of these lofts to spend increasing time away from pups, just as a rat in a more naturalistic setting might do. And also that rats without a getaway loft will show more passive nursing. And I'll provide some examples of what that would look like. So we used 16 rats and their litters for this study, and they're housed in these cages that had a removable upper loft portion. Um, they were housed with their rats for three weeks, um, that's typical in a laboratory setting that pups are weaned at about 21 days of age. Um, we recorded their behaviors using cameras and then we scored six hours per day per rat at various times of day. One of the behaviors we were really interested in was active nursing. So uh, this is also referred to as archback nursing where a dam will stand over her pups and support her weight with her back legs um, and provide easy access um, for her pups to nurse. 
and she might also be grooming her pups in this posture. So she's actively providing maternal care. In contrast, we also see passive nursing. And so this is basically any time when a dam is not actively standing over or grooming her pups. She might be lying on her back or on her side, or she might be actively trying to do something else like eating, drinking, or walking around. And we see this in the bottom picture here where this rat is trying to eat and there is a pup that's trying to nurse. When pups are 12 days of age, so this, this picture is an example of what a pup might look like around 12 days of age. Their eyes are open, they've got their fur, they're a little bit more mobile. Um, we see that there's not a huge difference between treatments in the amount of time spent actively nursing. So rats that don't have the loft are spending on average about 33% of their time actively nursing their pups. Rats that had access to a loft are spending about 27% of their time actively nursing. But when we look at the amount of time spent passively nursing, we can see that rats with no loft are spending about 20% of their time passively nursing pups. Whereas rats that had access to a loft are only spending about 4% of their time doing this behavior. When we look at loft use, we also see this increasing trend as we predicted. So when pups are five days old, we can see that they're hairless, their eyes are closed, they're quite small, they're not very mobile, and they're really dependent on maternal care. And we can see that dams are only spending about 27% of their time in the loft when pups are that old. However, when we look at a 17-day-old pup, they're quite large in comparison to a five-day-old pup. They have their fur, their eyes are open, they're very mobile, and they might also be able to eat dry food by this age. Um, so they're less dependent on maternal care. And we see that the, the moms are spending about 51% of their time in the loss at this stage. And this might be a strategy to reduce the time they spend nursing. So the analysis for this project is ongoing, but some of our preliminary conclusions are that rat dams make use of lofts when they're housed with their litters in a laboratory environment. And this might be a strategy to reduce passive nursing. And giving rat dams more control over time spent with pups may be beneficial for welfare. Getaway lofts should be provided to laboratory rats that are used for breeding so that they can exhibit more natural behavior. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the second project a little bit. So this is a project focused on providing playpen access uh, to standard house laboratory mice. So we see an example here again of what standard housing would look like. Um, this shoebox housing, and it's been well documented that this type of housing is detrimental to mouse welfare. Um, so when we compare mice provided with enrichment of some sort or with a larger, more complex environment, comparing them with standard house mice, we see that the standard house mice show increased pain responses, they show, show slower healing after invasive procedures, increased stereotypic or abnormal behaviors, and decrease resilience to stressors. However, facilities may not be willing or able to switch to larger or more enriched caging due to limited space or limited funding for new housing. I just wanna provide an example of what stereotypies look like um, in a laboratory environment. So if you focus on the gray and the white mice here, you can see it might look like they're eating, but they're actually gnawing on the metal bars of their cage. Um, and this is a stereotypic behavior that develops in mice that are housed for long periods of time in these cages. And the next behavior that you're going to see is called twirling. So if you focus on the gray mouse here again, you can see she's exhibiting some twirling behavior. Um, and this is an abnormal behavior that typically you'll see in this shoebox type of housing. And so one of our predictions for this project is that if we give mice uh, a break from these cages and let them out into a more naturalistic environment that we might reduce the development of these stereotypies. So our first, our first research question here is simply, are laboratory mice motivated to spend time in a more naturalistic environment? And here that will be our play pens. Um, this might seem intuitive, however, these are mice that have been bred for hundreds of generations specifically to be used in research and it might be assumed that they're well adapted to live in these little environments um, or maybe a novel or more naturalistic environment would be stressful for them. Our secondary question is, 
simply, does temporary access to enrichment provide welfare benefits, um, much in the same way that permanent access to enrichment would? So our predictions here are that mice will voluntarily enter the play pens, and this will get more, more quick over time. The second prediction is that mice will show increased anticipation prior to playpen access. And our third prediction is that playpen access will reduce the development of stereotypies. However, this is an ongoing project. We are currently running this. Um, so I'm only gonna talk about some results for this first prediction. So for this study, we had 14 cages of mice and we had three mice per cage. And we used three different strains that are commonly used in research. Um, and this served another purpose too. We were able to identify mice uh, by color and track individual differences. Um, on the right, you'll see our play pens. So we actually use the same rat cages as uh, I used in the previous study. Um, but here we removed a couple of the filters and then built a little tunnel to connect them. So mice had access to both of these big rat cages. The one on the left that looks darker is actually filled with a burrowing substrate, such as soil. The one on the right uh, is filled with more objects, um, such as nesting material, a running wheel, um, and climbing structures. And mice in the playpen treatment were given access to this environment three times per week for 30 minutes. To transfer mice in and out of the playpens, we used this tunnel system where mice were able to voluntarily enter and they were habituated to these tunnels before they were ever given access to the playpens. So the tunnel itself was not new, but the playpen was at the very beginning. And this is showing some mice that are um, habituated to the whole sort of routine where we give them this tunnel and they're able to go on their own to the playpen. And this served a couple of functions. Firstly, uh, it allowed us to avoid any unnecessarily handling of the mice that might have stressed them out. And it also allowed us to time how long it took them to go to the playpen once they were given access as a measure of their motivation to go there. And what we're seeing is that over time, mice entered the playpens more quickly. So on the first day, when it was a completely novel environment, we saw a lot of variability between the mice um, and it took them on average 162 seconds to enter the playpen. And there's potentially some differences between the different genetic strains of the mice here too. However, by day 14, mice are basically running to get into these playpens. It's taking on average about 12 seconds and for some much less than that. Um, so this might indicate that they find the playpen experience quite rewarding and that they're motivated to go there. I additionally would like to show you just an example of what anticipation looks like in these mice. Um, so I want you to picture uh, you're about to take your dog for a walk and you go get the leash and you, you say the word, we're gonna go for a walk, and your dog might start getting really excited, tapping their feet, uh, running around, because they know that the walk is about to come and they really enjoy going for a walk. And so it's sort of the same principle here, where these mice are trained to know that a cue means that they're either going to get playpen access or they're not. So on the left, we have our control mice. The cue is that finger dragging across the wire lid. The control mice spend most of their time in the nest and in the hut, they're cautiously sniffing. Whereas the mice on the right, you can see are much more active. They're walking around back and forth. Uh, they're walking more quickly, they're rearing. They just seem generally more excited to go to, go to this environment. Uh, whereas the mice on the left, um, nothing happens for them. So they, they wait this period and then their cage will go back on the cage rack, whereas the playpen mice, they'll wait this period and then they'll get access to the playpens. So this might be another indicator that playpen access is rewarding to these standard house mice. Finally, I would like to show you an example of some of the natural behaviors that we see when we put these standard house mice into a playpen environment. And I just wanna reiterate that these are mice that um, had never been in this type of environment before, and they've been bred in captivity for use in research. Um, however, we still see quite a range of natural behaviors when they're given the opportunity to do so. One of those being burrowing. So when mice have access to uh, a deeper burrowing substrate, uh, they show motivation to dig tunnels or dig holes. Um, burrowing is also quite important to laboratory rats, which has been shown by um, Joanna Makowska from our group. Mice also love to climb. They spend a lot of time climbing. Um, 
there's a lot of things in this environment for them to sniff. We don't clean it between different groups. So uh, there's novel smells. Uh, there's a running wheel for them to get exercise. And there's also just generally more space for them to do these active behaviors that they would not otherwise be able to do in their home cages. So some preliminary conclusions from this project are that laboratory mice show motivation to enter a playpen. They also display a range of natural behaviors when they're in the playpens. Um, and so these playpens might be an immediate solution to increase environmental enrichment in a laboratory environment where uh, the purchase of new housing is maybe not an option. Uh, these playpens might have other welfare benefits uh, such as reduced stereotypies. However, data collection is ongoing for this. Uh, I would just like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Dan Weary, um, and my collaborator, Dr. Joanna Mikowska, who is um, also running the Mouse Playpen project with me. Uh, we'd like to thank our animal care technicians at UBC, as well as all of our mice and rats, without whom none of this research would be possible, um, and our colleagues at the Animal Welfare Program. Um, thank you for listening, and uh, please feel free to contact me with any comments or questions, and my contact information is at the bottom there. Thank you.